All right. Leslie Dunlop is a geologist based at Northumbria University with a keen interest in the geology of the region and has led many field trips for students, local and international groups. She's also involved with geoconservation and geodiversity nationally and internationally. Tonight's talk, when Scotland and England collided, the closing of an ocean, uh, until about 420 million years ago, the land we now know as Scotland was separated from England by a large ocean, the Iapetus Ocean. As the ocean closed and the continents collided, rocks were altered, mountain ranges higher than any on Earth today were built, and volcanoes erupted vast quantities of ash and pyroclastic debris. This talk will give you an opportunity to follow the timeline of events to the death of the Iapetus Ocean uh, and the geological joining of England and Scotland. In Northern England and Southern Scotland, we can still see evidence of this dramatic event in the rocks exposed today. Using the rocks and landscape of the border counties, the geological evidence for this will be explored and the exciting features that tell the story will be revealed. And without further ado, I shall hand you over to Leslie. Hi, can you hear me okay? Great, brilliant. Okay, and thanks very much, Carl, and thanks for everybody else for attending tonight. Um, when Kath asked me to give a talk, she originally mentioned one I'd done on the Permian some years ago, and I'm really pleased I didn't go with that because Carl can do that much better than I can. Um, so I decided I'd talk about something that really is a, a little bit distant, we can't see much of it, and it all finished about 400 million years ago. But the idea behind it is to just say how we can get a story out of the limited amount of information that we've got and build it up from there. And so I'd like to start off just outlining a bit of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I originally put this some of this talk together for um, 2017 when it was the 50th anniversary of the theory of plate tectonics when it first came into being. So unlike a lot of you, this is well within my lifetime. Um, so, you know, it gave an answer to a lot of the things that up till then had been loosely called continental drift, et cetera, et cetera. Well, say a little bit about um, ocean closure and continental collision, just to set the picture, um, where the Iapetus Ocean was and where the suture is, um, where the two continents collided, uh, and what evidence we can see for it. And as I say, the, the ocean and the activity was largely finished by about 400 million years ago. So I am going back a long way in time. But this is why I don't do plants or animals, because, you know, these rocks don't move very much. Um, so just a, a, a sort of recap on things that you may know or may have forgotten. Um, the ocean ridge, uh, the ocean crust is formed at mid-ocean ridges and tends to be dense material, so it's basaltic also not very thick you know in comparison to continents the ocean crust is only about five to eight kilometers thick but it is denser than continental crust continental crust has a, an average composition of, of that of a granite so it's got less of the heavy elements such as iron and magnesium in it and so when the two collide even though the continent is thicker the ocean crust is denser, so we'll, we'll sort of slide underneath. And this diagram over here on the right is really the key to what we're doing. So the, with the Iapetus Ocean, the ocean crust is sliding down below the continental crust. As it does so, it generates some magma, but definitely some faulting and folding on the continental side and it will scrape off some of the sediments that were on the top of the ocean crust before it goes down. That's just a, a little bit about the, the type of activity that I'm talking about um, that we were close to 
four to five hundred million years ago. And if you want a, a modern analogy, then I think the the movement of India hitting Eurasia is quite a good analogy. So going back to 25 million years ago, India was a large island off the coast of Australia. Now, what you've got to think here is that the Eurasian plate, Europe and Asia at the top, is pretty massive. And, you know, it's not going to move anywhere. So basically, if, they, if there's a push coming from down the south here, and it's shoving this bit, this is acting like a, a brick wall, and India's just slamming into it. So about 80 million years ago, India was down here about six and a half thousand kilometers south. And during the 70 million years, it's moved and hit this large plate here, and it's still moving. This is a relatively fast moving plate because it, it was basically the Indian bit is quite light. Um, the closure of IAPA is probably a slower rate, but we're talking about a similar type of thing, that we were part of a larger continental mass on the southern side. So that's just a, a modern analogy of the types of things we were looking at. Now, here's a diagram of the Iapetus Ocean. So what I'd like you to take out of this one is that Scottish part of the continental mass is up here, fairly close to the, just south of the equator. 500 million years ago, the English side was part of a continental mass about as far south of the equator as we are north today. And there's a, a distance of about 5,000 kilometers between those two. So it starts to move. And as with all of these things, it doesn't just move in a straight line, it sort of curves up about 400 million years, up 460 million years, up to 430 million years when they collide. So we've got a closure there happening. Um, where the English bit is really sort of slamming into this larger, more northerly landmass. And the time frame of that was, it started at about 480 million years, this ocean started to shrink, and then finished at about 420 million years, where the continents were finally joined, although the activity the post-collision igneous activity continued for at least, I mean, up under these millions of years round, it con con continued for about 30 million years. And the, the Shap granite, which I'll come on to at the end, is dated at about 395 million years. And some of the granites on the northern side are nearer to 400, 420. So, you know, I might say, relatively short geologically, 25 million years, but quite a long time, really. Um, so that was, that's the sequence of events. And where did it join? I think it's useful to have this in your mind at the beginning. So remember that anything south of this dotted line originally started down about 60 degrees south of the equator. Anything north of there was on the northern land mass and was about 10 degrees south of the equator. And the suture line runs from the Solway Firth across swinging just south of the Cheviots and out across the North Sea. I mean, I'm sure they could have done it better. We could have put our English Scottish border along it, but you know, that's that's where it is. So but the chief it then would have been in Scotland. It's nice to have them in Northumberland. Uh, so that's where the suture line is. Um, I'll just point out, I've put this map up a couple of times throughout the talk anyway, but I'll just mention that here we've got the chief it's, which is an igneous body. Um, the red bits on this map are granites. So those are intrusive igneous material, so plutons, cooling at depth. So north of the suture line, I've got granite here at Criffel, 
another one at Fleet, and there's the Cheviot Massif. The paler pinkish colour are lavas, and we'll come on to those towards the end. Down on the southern side, we've got the some Lake District granites, um, and of course there are other granites on this side, but we don't see them at the surface. So that's the sort of basic setting the scene. I'll come back to some of these other bits later on in the talk. This is a classic diagram of the Iapetus Ocean closing. And in a way, I hate it um, because there's just so much on it that it's difficult to pull it apart. And it's also got typical geologists. We hide behind a lot of names that aren't used in everyday language. So by now you should be familiar with Iapetus Ocean. Um, we've mentioned that several times, but you know, these bits like Laurentia and down here, I've got Avalonia. I don't remember those. Um, you know, I do if I see the diagram, but you know, it's not something that's natural to me. Um, so don't worry about the words at all. What you, all you need to know off this map is that this is the Northern side. This is the southern side. And about four, four 90 million years ago, and this is the other good thing about this, nobody can prove exactly what these dates are. They can prove when abouts they are, but they can't prove that, you know, this is exactly when, apart from a few of the igneous bits where you can date a bit more clearly. But even those dates come in with usually plus or minus five million years. Um, so anyway, we've got this large ocean, which is about 5,000 kilometers wide. We've got Scotland on one side. We've got the rest of England on the southern side. As it starts to close, then we've got subduction certainly happening under the Scottish end but there's also evidence of subduction happening at both sides. So on both sides of this ocean, oceanic crust is being subducted. How do we know that? That's because there are some volcanic um, events that we can link to it. And gradually we end up, this bit hasn't moved on the north, Laurentia, still there, but the bit that we've called A. Avalonia has now come and met it. So that's our suture line running down here. That's where the Iapetus Ocean has gone. You can forget about this sort of Reic Ocean here. That's just adding another complication in. It's still there for another 100 million years. And, that's, and if you want to know about that, that's Kevin Cornwall and lots of stuff in France and Spain and Portugal, and we get the collision events from that. So what we're interested in is just this bit, the fact that this ocean closed with subduction, largely happening under the Scottish side, but a little bit under the Lake District, eventually getting up so it closes and collides and finishes there. So we've lost that whole ocean. And this is the bit of background geophysical evidence that we have of what I'm really going to be linking on to. Once the idea of the plate tectonics model had come about and um, there was a lot of work going on in the Northeast and about this anyway, um, that they began to look at the idea that there was there's obviously something that's happening across the UK here. There's a lot of parallel faults. There's a lot of igneous activity. And so it was postulated that there was a difference between the southern uplands, the southern part of Scotland, and the northern part of England. And the fossil evidence backed this up. So they got some money to run some seismics, some geophysics, and lots of other tests running down this seismic line here, and showed that there were subsurface features that were compatible with 
ocean closure. And they show largely a northerly dipping boundary under the southern uplands. And they inferred this boundary line, the suture line. So I'll show you on the next slide the um, just something that, if you like, this one, unlike my others, the north is on the right hand side of this diagram and the south on the other side. But you can see that what they picked up on the geophysics was this rather more dense wedge material, that would be the oceanic crust type of material, just dipping down below Scott. And yeah, okay, so this finished 400 million years ago. But I mentioned here that in 1979, there was an earthquake in Carlisle. And that's due to later movement along some of these faults. These faults may have ceased their main movement about 400 million years ago, but they still control a lot of what's happening in the area. The lines of the subsurface faults still control where we've got sedimentation happening during the Carboniferous and later as well, and later movements. Um, and I've been trying to find out, because last week the, there were a couple of earthquakes in Scotland, and I've been trying to see if they are also linked with some of the more northerly bits of this type of, of fault here. But certainly here, so in seven, 1979, there was quite a large earthquake in Carlisle on Boxing Day, and caused quite a da lot of damage in a small area. So epicenter here in Carlisle, but effects felt for quite a long distance away from it. So although the Iapetus Ocean long since closed, there is still, if, if, if there's some lubrication and stress buildup, there's still movement on these faults. So it's still... Um, so just to pick off some bits that I'm going to highlight in the next bit of the talk, I've mentioned, I'm back to having the north on the left-hand side now, mentioned that this bit doesn't move. This bit with the English side moves up from the south. As it moves up, the subduction zone changes slightly to being from going under the Lake District end to going under solely under the Scottish side. As it goes and closes, so as these two plates come together, we scrape off some of the material from the top of the ocean floor onto the land mass. And some of that gets, if you like, picked up so it's on the surface. And going further, that begins to show even more, and we start to develop some of those faults I was talking about that are parallel to the line of the suture. So we end up with, if you like, a bit of a mess. Unfortunately, we don't see that on the eastern side of the country because we've plonked too much carboniferous material on top of it to be able to see much of what's there. You can see a little bit on the sort of Scottish side, but it's better seen over on the western coast. So on this bit here, I've got a bit called the Ballon Tray, and we've got Girvan mentioned here. So it's easier to go and see these things on the, on the western side. I blame the Carboniferous must. Um, and if you look at a geological map of this bit of southwest Scotland, you can see here the fact that there's a lot of fault alignment running from the um, southwest up to the northeast, i.e. almost parallel to that suture line. And so as the material was closing, then bits were being squeezed together and piled up. And we end up with some of the ocean floor being present in some of these areas here, particularly around Ban Tray. But we also see a lot of the scraped up sediments 
And there's a little bit of igneous activity as well, because no, none of this happens without things heating up and giving you some igneous activity. So I'll just show you there. I remember going to see this as an undergraduate on, a, on one of our self-organised field trips. I was really excited to go and see some of this scraped up ocean floor. And I was, to say I was disappointed. I was a little bit disappointed. It's not a very big exposure. It's not a very splendid one, but what you can see um, is this idea of pillow lavas. So the top part of the ocean crust, which is billow lavas, basalt. We've seen pictures of these on things like David Attenborough, where he's always showing bits where they're sort of squeezing out another thing and they come out like toothpaste. Um, and you can see these little bits here. So you've got these rather lovely bits of pillow lava. If you've ever been to Cyprus, you'll see these very, very nicely. And there are some nice bits out on Pembrokeshire and, and other bits where you get lavas coming out underwater. Anyway, this is particular in, of interest because just north of this Southern Uplands Fault, and it's part of that ocean floor that was scraped up onto land whilst the rest of it has disappeared and long since been recycled. So it's a, a bit that's left behind. Um, so that's, that's our bit of pillow lava, so evidence of ocean floor. If we go on to the east coast, so what do we see there? So rather than having the bits of scraped up ocean floor, what we can see on the east coast, particularly at Sickle Point, is evidence of what happened to the sediments and how those have been affected. So anywhere Sickle Point, down to Burnmouth, Eyemouth, those, those, well, Burnmouth particular, you, you begin to see what happened with those seafloor sediments, which are largely Silurian in age. Um, I don't know if all of you listening have been to Sicker Point. Um, there are some lovely interpretation boards there explaining what happened. I will say that Hutton, who described it first in the late 18th century, had the great sense to go by boat because there are lots of times when you're going down to Sicker Point and you go down this fairly steep um, bit onto this bit of foreshore here. And what you really want to do is grab onto this fence, which is very wobbly and it's barbed wire. So not advised. Um, but even from the top, you can see begin to see that there's different things. And if you're there on a clear day, um, I have been there on days when it's been too misty to even see the bottom. Um, but if you're there on a clear day like this was, um, you can see that there are some rocks over here, which you can see are tilted, end up, and some other bits which are flatter. And so, and, and they're also a different color. That always helps when you're looking at things, if they're different colors. And so the two types of rocks we've got here, the ones that are tilted are these, are what's known as grey wackies and mudstones. So they're these deep water, seawater deposited sediments. Some of them are deposited in calm water or some of them in much more um, fast turbidic type water deposits. But anyway, that's what they are. So they, these are Silurian in age and they've been scraped up while some of it has gone down, um, down into the recycling bit. And they're overlain by sandstones of Devonian age, so younger. And if you remember where we were, we were just south of the equator. So these are desert sandstones. So we've got a mixture here of some rocks which represent deep water deposition and some which are land-based and desert conditions. So once you get once you get down this slippery slope, I've usually found it better to do it on my bottom, I have to, um, or zigzag down the cliff. Um, you can see these fabulous, fabulous vertical beds here. These are the Silurian 
sediments. So they they would originally have been horizontal. They've been upended partly by being scraped off and partly with this squeezing together as the plates collide. But they've also been eroded because you've got this bit here, which is the unconformity. And clearly these would have not just gone tilt like that and stopped. They've been tilted and then they've been eroded down and the Devonian sandstones laying on top of them. And there is about a 65 million year time gap. So if you put your hand just on that bit between the vertical and the sub horizontal, you're looking at a time gap of about 65 million years. So, you know, I and mean, these are the sorts of things that I like. And as I say, it always helps, I think, if you're looking at the unconformity, these gaps, color, um, so you can see it, but also that they are clearly, clearly angled very different. So that's that's a classic locality of signal point. And as I say, they've got some, if you haven't been there or you haven't, you haven't been there recently over the last few years, the interpretation boards, which are at the top, you don't have to climb down, um, are very good at explaining what's there. And there's some nice car, car parking bits. Um, just a, another close-up, just showing this red Devonian sandstone. And so again, this typical red sandstone that you get in desert conditions, just like you get in the Permian um, on the west coast of Cumbria, when it was same desert conditions, but you know, 200, about 100 and odd million years later, but when we were crossing the northern part of the equator. And here's the vertical sediments from the, the oceanic sediments. So brilliant stuff there. Go down to Burnmouth, which is not very far away. So if you're up there already, you may as well go down there. Um, and walk on the cliff path on the northern side of the harbour. This is just looking down towards the south. That you can also see these Silurian grey wackies again. Um, the foreshore, when the tide's out, you'll see the red Devonian rocks. You can see those. And if you look in closely at the ocean floor sediments on the northern side of the harbour, and, and you can walk right up to these, you can see that they've got the, the beds here are, are again vertical. This is looking at the base of the bed. And you can see there are groove marks and you can work out, you know, which way up the beds were, um, whether they're slightly overturned or vertical or the right, you know, sort of just slightly sub-vertical um, and see these fabulous casts on the base of the bed. Um, this is a much nicer place to go and look at these types of features. When, when I used, when I first saw features like this, it was on, the, a cutting on the A9, no, not the A9, the A6, over in Cumbria, um, on a quite a busy road. But this is really nice, because if you look one way, you've got, you know, you've got the beautiful harbour behind you here, and then you've got these fabulous, fabulous um, bits of evidence of these Silurian water, ocean sediments. So just a reminder of what we covered at Sicker Point, that before the deposition of the Devonian, which is above them, beds were tilted, no longer covered by the ocean. So this is eye mouth. And you can see here that you're dealing with some red sandstones, slightly dipping. And there is an evidence of some fluvial activity. You can see this type of material. No, I think this is Peace Bay. Sorry, I apologise. Next one's I'm at. Um, that you can see that these are really sort of typical red sandstones. Evidence mainly of of, of a sort of desert environment with, with some water, some fluvial deposition around it. And you can see these all around the borders. 
and I think when I've shown this before, I've shown a picture of the cathedral over at Melrose, which is built out of this and it's been well worth a look at. Um, you want to go and see it used as a building stone. Right. Good. Yeah. So moving on now a bit to the igneous activity. So I mentioned before that the igneous activity is largely centered, that what we can see in the Northeast is largely centered from the Cheviots. So we've got this paler pink bit around the edge, which is the evidence of lavas. Remember, there would have been much more of this um, because what we're seeing is what's left after both erosion and then covering with the later deposited material. So we've got typical igneous rocks in the Cheviots are andesites, the type of lava you get um, at a collision border, which are extrusive, and we've got some intrusive granites with some rhyolite, which is the fine grained equivalent. I always think of the, the rhyolite as being mainly used for those bits. Of, you don't see so much of it these days, but when, when you used to drive around and they had those sort of slightly pinky things on the road surfacing, that, that, that to me is that Cheviot rhyolite. So that's the slight pink rock got there. And a reminder that this is on the northern edge of the suture. So this igneous activity is happening as the ocean slab slides down at that sort of 25 degree angle beneath the, as the southern slab slides down under the northern bit here, and it's melting, and heating up some of the bits. Well, and if you walk around in enough places up in that sort of deviant side, you'll find some evidence of thermal metamorphism, um, some, some of those heat effects that you get as well. And also this idea of hydrothermal activity when you start to get water incorporated or you know, volatiles that you start to get new minerals. And one of the characteristic minerals that's often associated with deep water sediments as well being mixed in with it is a mineral called tourmaline. Um, you don't see a lot of it up here. It's much more common in the Southwest um, where the later ocean closure was, but. There is, I've seen tourmaline up in the, up in Hartoe Burn there. Um, and that's caused, particularly when you've got volatiles coming in from seawater sediments, which contain boron, because the chemical formula of tourmaline might be a pretty mineral, but it's got a chemical formula that's beyond my capability of remembering. Um, what I do remember is it has boron. Very pretty. The, a gemstone, but a nightmare of the chemical formula. So a little bit here just on what I was mentioning. So I said that most of the rock types are andesite. These are volcanic, extrusive lavas. And they are what, what are known as intermediate. So they're halfway in silica content between the basaltic end and the granitic end. And they, they're sort of halfway in everything. Between that, so they're intermediate. There are some granite plutons at depth, and if the granite gets up closer to the surface and cools quickly, then it's known as a rhyolite, or in older terms, in particularly in this area, it was known as a felsite. If you come across that word, it's the same. The rock types we're dealing with are in this triangle here. At depth, we've got the high silica content ones, and splurging out nearer or on the surface, we've got andesites and a little bit of rhyolite. Um, color wise, they, they usually, these are paler, these get darker as you go that way. Okie dokie, so that's just a nice picture of the scenery up there. And I think the other thing about these rock types is that they are resistant to weathering. So, We've had a lot of glaciation in the area since they were deposited. There, there would have been some cover over, it them, over them at times. There's no evidence in the central bit of the Chief, it's now of that cover. 
but there is other types of evidence around of, of sort of later activity. So if you're standing up there, the harder rocks of this volcanic complex are more resistant to weathering. And some of it even more so where you've got some dikes, some of the vertical intrusions running through, but it gives a much, a much harsher landscape and, and much more difficult to do anything. So I'll zip back to across the border now, cross back up to Eyemouth. And this is a, one of the best places to go and look at some of the, the lavas there is a rather large piece of material there and lots of fragments. And what you've got to think about is this volcano wasn't just sort of splurging out gently bits of igneous material, it was quite explosive. This is a large piece that's been carried quite a distance. Um, so, and as I said, mostly in composition, these are andesitic. They've been quite gassy, so quite explosive, and they've carried material out and large ang angular clasps of material, showing that it's just exploded it and carried it out to eye mouth. Again, well worth a, a trip up. So, when you're up there doing Sicker Point, Burn Mouth, you've got eye mouth and nice ice creams on the beach. <laughs> and if, you, if you're really, really, really hankering after something a bit less old, um, you can look at the material above where you're looking at some of the channel infills from the, the glacial period. But the rock below is this, this paler rock is this igneous material. It's, similar to an andesite or rhyolite, it's part way in between. Again, that, as I say, we like to just throw out a lot of parts of a lot of different terms. So we're dealing here with a, a an explosive volcanic rock covered by a conglomerate. Again, good color difference. Um, so I'll come on to the sort of coming towards the, the sort of later events. Some of the last things that were happening, as well as the explosive lavas, was at depth there was intrusion of granites. On the northern side, we've got a little bit of exposure of some of this granite up in the Cheviots. It is exposed in the Cheviots. And there's also these ones over on the southwest Scotland side, Griffel granite and Fleet granite. And then we've got the Lake District. And again, we've got the big sub subsurface one under Weirdale as well. And these, they, they range in age. So they span, if you like, the very final stages of closure of the Iapetus Ocean. The ones on the northern side are, are older. And they're dated around about 420 million years. The ones on the southern side, like Shaft, are about 390, 395. Um, so they came later after the closure had happened. And there's been some modeling done of, of some of these. So we've got this is the Criffle one, um, Fleet. Loch Doon, the, these are all just sort of surface exposures of them. Under, underneath, they're probably they're largely joined, although the Scottish one's slightly less so than the Lake District. If we take a look at the next picture. Oh, sorry, I, I'll just go back to that one, because it also shows on this one um, the extent of some of the lavas. So we've got lavas here, 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 and, and coming around here. So you get an idea that, you know, these lavas are not just seen in one place, they can be in others. And this is the idea of these three main Scottish granites that they come up as sort of, if you like, top exposures of, of a, a larger um, feeder chamber underneath. The Lake District one is this massive bath lift where we get small bits 
sticking out and being exposed on the surface. These and and again, I could show similar for the Weardell granite, similar age. Almost at the end of what I'm going to say, and I have to finish with this because if anybody knows me, this is my favourite granite. I do love a granite, um, and I've got a lot from various places around, particularly in Europe and Portugal and Brittany and things. But the Shap granite is my favourite. And, you know, the, the good thing, as you know about the Shap granite, is you don't have to go very far to see it. I'm, I'm pretty certain that this is one of the facing stones of Monument Station rather than Central Station. So, you know, if you want to hold up the traffic, which I frequently do, you know, if they're rushing down to catch the metro, then go and you know, just spend some time looking at the Shap granite with its fabulous big pink phenocrysts and the xenoliths of the earlier, slightly more mafic material caught up in it, slightly rounded. And the fact that these phenocrysts aren't just in this bit, they're in across all of it. And, you know, you, know, you can, as far as I'm concerned, you can do an hour's worth lecture on those, but I'm not going to just leave you with the idea of the, the shap granite and, and the fact that we were able to go and look at it really easily these days if you're in central Newcastle. Um, so final slide, just to finish us up, is can you actually see evidence of this suture anywhere? And the answer, you know, as you can see, that the answer for that is not going to be on the Northern England Scottish border side, because that's covered by so much else. But yes, go to the Isle of Man and you can stand like this person's doing. Um, you can stand with one foot on one side and one foot on the other. So you, you're crossing the difference um, between the, the rocks that existed on the northern continent and the rocks which existed on the southern part of the continent. And the, the line there where all the um, sort of veining is, is the actual suture line. So splendid. You know, you can actually see evidence of this suit on the Isle of Man. And I leave you with this. This is from Bowden Doors, which um, Carl and I were talking about earlier, looking straight west towards the Cheviots. And, on a, and it's beautiful to just get this idea of the, the Cheviot massif here, of its andesites um, with the granites and spewing out lava. You can imagine it's spewing out lava all over that sort of southern Scotland bit. But this is why you can't see much more of it because between, I mean, these are fabulous sandstones in their own right. But if you're standing here, you're looking across things which, are, which have been deposited onto this Cheviot Massey. So you're looking here at some of the lower carboniferous material. It does repeat a bit because there are some faults here. But you're looking at some of the low carboniferous material here into what was here before. So the Cheviot Massif, largely of Devonian age and the volcanic. So I hope that's been a, a sort of quick tour around what happened when we lost 5,000 kilometers of the Iapetus Ocean and what we can see of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, that's a, a wonderful talk. I'm uh, just wondering how you got access to my slide collection. <laughs> <laughs> I've got pictures, almost identical pictures of a whole load of those places. Um, but unfortunately, not the Isle of Man. It's on the list of places that I still have to go to. Um, but yeah, uh, wonderful, wonderful set of uh, images there uh, of a wonderful borderlands um, and uh, a great story uh, about the coming together of Scotland and England. OK, um, if people would like to put questions in the chat for Leslie uh, or want to unmute and ask, then uh, go ahead. Uh, there's a couple of people who had to disappear. So uh, 
apologies for those um, from those people having to go, but they they'll be able to catch up on the rest of it on the on the uh, video recording. Okay, right. Paul, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that at least I can see people a bit more. Fine. That yeah. Helps? Yeah, that's okay. So as I say, either pop them into chat or you can unmute. Okay, Robert, fire away, Robert. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I've got two questions, really. The first one is, uh, I think, relatively straightforward, but how far does the suture extend into the North Sea? And uh, have you seen evidence for that? And the second one is really clear, clearly explained um, talk about the physics of what happened but I'm just dumbfounded who was the first person to, to just have that brainwave about tectonic movement and then put two sets of evidence together to come up with a concept yeah um the the base the answer to the first one is that the suture does extend quite uh, across the north sea and a lot of the stuff that we see you know a lot of the geophysics that was done on land was partly done here in order to explain some of the stuff that they were seeing subsurface. And um, one of the th things about the North Sea is that, the, again, it's at depth. It's not sort of on the surface there. So, you know, we're lucky in a way that the land bit has got the, the higher bit, but there is evidence. I mean, it does extend across because the Northern Plate had some bits of, of Scandinavia on it, but the southern plate had the other bits, so to, there is bits of evidence there, but it's largely quite hidden. Um, as your, your other one about the um, the idea of the two plates, yes. <laughs> um, I think having having got the idea, and it, and it was you know really post war once they started to get the evidence from some of the. Um, physics evidence they'd been picking up particularly around the states and things that they they'd always got evidence that there was a lot of folding there's a lot of difference in in, in the UK and a lot of parallel faults I mean we, we were lucky because we'd got you know all these early maps um you know some of the the earliest geological maps and things so there was always an, an idea that there was a difference but there wasn't an explanation for it and so it was once they began to think about, you know, the idea that maybe continents were moving. So we were talking here about continental drifting, but there was this big push and it came, a lot of it came from um, the, the Northern universities that perhaps if we ran some geophysics over some of these bits, we would pick up and pick up this idea of, the, you know, we why there was a big difference, why there were these parallel faults, and perhaps there was this closure. We, and also picking up on the idea of the buried granites under Weirdale. So we're sort of back in the 60s here. So there's a lot of geophysics going on in the area, a lot of aeromagnetic and density contrast things. And I think it was just one of those things that suddenly you know, it became apparent here. I mean, you get the same effects in North America too, in some parts, but it was just that post-war putting together the idea of, of this geophysical evidence and the early computing thing, so you could take on a lot more data and, and get it into um, some sort of theory that you could begin to explain it. I don't know if anybody else wants to come in on that, Carl. You got anything to add on to that? I was going to go back even further in, yeah. in with with the fossil evidence and yeah. that uh, fossils um, uh, on the northern side of the suture, trilobites and things like that, don't match up with fossils yeah. on our side, um, and yet fossils on the Scottish side match up with ones in northern Newfoundland um, and uh, not in southern Newfoundland or Nova Scotia. Which one is it? One or the other? But uh, and showing you that the, these organisms were common to each other north of the suture um, and 
common to each other south of the suture, but there was a distinct difference either side, showing that there must have been some separation between the two. Uh, and that goes much further back, well, uh, you know, mid-18, late 1800s. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's another question. Yeah, John? Do you want to unmute? Oh, I can't hear you. Can't, can't hear you, John. <clears throat> no. No. Is it the same question as you put in the chat? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay. I've got that. <laughs> so, so, so yes, how, yeah. how do you know? Um, I stated in your intro that all this was once high. Well, I'm not sure it was. I mean, I, I, I said that was a, an analogy rather than that it was that high. I don't think it was. I mean, what we can say about parts of the Dalradian in Scotland and the Cairngorms in, in that sort of Caledonian orogeny is that they were certainly high we you know because we've got evidence of metamorphism one of the things that we don't have in the north if if you like is that idea of the metamorphism of the material so i don't i haven't seen anything to show how high what what i can say is that the fact that we've got granites exposed at the surface means that we've lost at least five kilometers of material from above those because granites typically um, solidify depending on you know their composition be somewhere between five and eight kilometers depending what composition they are but um, and there's no and, and because we're seeing them at the surface we've, we've clearly lost that but it's not like up in the up in the Dalredi in that sort of bit of Scotland around the Cairngorms, where we've got evidence of high, highly metamorphosed rocks, giving you that sort of great depth, such as the Himalayas, so 90 kilometers, something like that. So I don't think we did, I don't think we were, and I think I was just using it more as a, a sort of idea of the continental collision, but not the, not the idea about, um, of, of the height. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a little button on here that uh, I haven't pressed. Yeah, I'm interested, David. Thanks for your comment because uh, Dewey taught me when I was at Durham as an undergraduate in the early 80s, and I was out on a field trip with him about 18 months ago. Um, so it's interesting that he was talking about rafts rather than plates, because yes, by 67, he's clearly into plate. <laughs> yeah. But, but meanwhile, he, um, he was talking, he was a physical geology course, or first year geography, uh, and he was also talking about uh, geomorphology. Quite wrongly, asserted that rivers flow swiftly in the mountains and flow uh, on the plains. But the geographers had got it right. They just realized that if you actually measure the speed of rivers, the Thames flows miles faster in headwaters. And I'm sure if you had through the time in most other big rivers as well. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you still going? Yeah. I, I mean, Dewey's still going strong. Well, I mean, I haven't seen him <laughs> for 18 months. Went on a trip to, a, oh, it's probably two years ago this in December. We did a trip which involved going to Hook Norton Brewery in Oxfordshire, which he was very keen on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has he has he lost his hair? Because at that time yeah. he had a mop of blonde hair like Boris. No, he hasn't. And and actually, interestingly, he was 
he did he did actually does actually know Boris from Oxford. <laughs> uh, Leslie, um, just south of Ballantrae, yeah. south of the Stinker Fault, and I can't remember the name of the bit of shore, but there are the most wonderful pillow lavas. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I missed those. Then. Yeah, and yeah. They're, they're not quite the same formation, but they're just like wonderful, you know, tubes of toothpaste sort of, and they're tilted, and you can just see the surfaces all... Intermingling, oh, it's absolutely oh, superb. It's yeah, it's, it's it's wonderful. But yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. there's loads of play. I mean, the, the picture you showed at Burnmouth with the uh, bottom structures on the. Um, mm. I've not seen those. Right. <laughs> well, if you, yeah, times, you just but need, I'll have to have to go yeah, back. I mean, they're really easy to see. You just yeah. park on the northern side, take that footpath that goes along the northern cliff yeah. there, and they're fabulous. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we just normally drive right down and park mm. in Burnmouth and walk uh, southwards along the shore. And I've seen them mentioned in the guidebooks and stuff, but I've never stopped. But Burnmouth's on the list of localities to visit this year, so, uh, so I'll make sure <laughs> make sure we see them. That's uh, wonderful. Yeah, splendid. Great, yeah. Okay. Right, well, uh, any more questions? That looks to be about it. But i uh, just like to say thank you once again to everybody who's... Uh, being present for the talk and thank you Leslie for presenting to, for the GA being really really informative very interesting and it just makes me want to get back out in the field again uh, and, and visit some of these places yeah yeah I don't you seem to get better weather on your trips with me. <laughs> yeah. I've got photos of the same places in their uh, misty conditions sicker point um I knew, know somebody who just went up there a few weeks ago and that path down by the fence is just getting worse and worse and worse um the all this sort of foot marks mm. are, are like this now and if it's wet at all you're just going to slide down yeah. i always i always zigzag down um, and and up again it's it's the only way to get down there but uh, i've probably been down four or five times in my life and i'm not desperate to go down there again <laughs> I'm quite happy to take the view from the top unless somebody really does want to go down there. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely think Hutton had the right idea of going by boat. Yeah, oh, certainly, <laughs> certainly. And it's nice to try and do the three. If you go to Jedburgh and look at Hutton's oh, Unconformity yes. at Jedburgh yes. and then Newton Point on Arran, which is probably the, my favourite, I think, out of the out of the three, Newton Point on Arran. Um, it's just, just well, because Arran's got everything. <laughs> oh, no, no, you see, I've never been to Arran. Oh wow! Yeah, because I, I I did a lot on Mull. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and we went to Rum and Sky, but we uh, didn't go to Arran. Well, when I was at school, um, I went to Dame Allen's, and um, my school used to do a trip to Arran every year uh, for a particular year group, and I didn't go, so I always wanted to go. And the first time I ever went was in two thousand and nine. And I've been about eight times now. <laughs> you, just, you just can't keep me away. Uh, and it's just, I mean, a 20 mile island and it's just got so yeah. much geology and most of yeah. it, you just fall out the car and it's on the shore. Uh, so, so it's a wonderful place to, to, uh, to go for geology. Yeah, I have to say, I, I, my favourite's Mull. Yeah, been been a couple of times. I will will go back there again. But, uh, it's getting it, it, too many uh, tourists now. That's a problem. <laughs> and Sky, for that matter. But uh, we'll we'll get back uh, to it. Great. Okay. Well, um, if that's it, I shall stop recording now.